All right, guys, I've got noon. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Um, welcome. We're going to get started. I'll keep admitting people as they arrive. Hopefully they, they do. Um, I'm actually at the Babe Ruth birthplace right now upstairs. Um, I'm going to introduce Frank in a second. Uh, hopefully you've, you've read his bio a little bit. Um, our next meeting will be um, first Wednesday of September, um, which I think is the 8th, if I'm not mistaken. Um, info on speaker and stuff will be coming out in the next couple of weeks. I was hoping Bruce would join us, but he hasn't yet. He is in Canada awaiting the birth of a grandchild. Um, for those of you guys, I assume are all Saber members, the uh, book came out um, last week. I'm not sure when it started to but mine arrived sometime last week. Um, I haven't started reading it yet, but uh, Saber members can get 40% off uh, all that info and discount codes and stuff are in the, the emails and stuff that come to us from uh, headquarters. Um, hopefully you're all on our Gmail list and you got the, the copy of the Baltimore Chop came out last week and it was fairly interesting. Um, looking to do another one sometime by the, uh, the end of the baseball season um, in September. Um, so Frank, some of us who uh, were here at the birthplace three years ago, I guess, Frank was here to talk about when his book series started. Here's all three of them. Um, I think, uh, Frank, when you were here, summer of 17, the second would have just come out. Um, obviously, I have all three. I've read all three. Wonderful. I'll let you uh, do the background on them and uh, let us all know how you got started. I will keep admitting people and I will, and nobody can hear me. Well, that's not good. I can hear you. I can hear you. Everybody can hear? Yes, can I, hear? I can hear you. Yep. Okay. I'm gonna have to, Frank, I have to unmute mute you. And we're getting more people joining. So I'm trying to juggle one uh, bunch of stuff here at once. All right, Frank, if you're uh, you're ready, go right ahead and take over. It's wonderful to join you here today. Uh, thanks to Peter and the Cold uh, Shot Chapter of Saber for this opportunity to talk about my favorite ball player, George Herman Babe Ruth. I call this presentation All the Lies About Babe Ruth Are True, quoting his former teammate, uh, Wade Hoyt. Babe Ruth, is the, Babe Ruth is the greatest ball player ever, period. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on stats where they speak for themselves. His transformative impact on the game will never be matched. Even though Babe Ruth's career started over a century ago, he remains relevant. Uh, recall the excitement several years ago uh, that the Japanese Babe Ruth Shohai Otani, a two-way phenom who was compared to Babe Ruth. Uh, there are two articles in the spring edition of Sable Research about the Babe. The Babe is even part of the discussion of the most pressing issues of the day. If you had an opportunity to see July's Sports Illustrated, uh, you can uh, find a novella 
written by Tom Perducci, which talks about the pandemic and the Spanish flu of 1918. Also, on the issue of race, uh, I'll talk about it a little later, but uh, Dave is certainly relevant in connection with the see someone who can, can't hear me. Can everybody, can you hear me, Peter? Okay. Uh, so Dave is uh, very integral to the legal, uh, the uh, sports issues and societal issues of the day. Uh, this is me, as a young boy, uh, my family took me to Cooperstown and uh, I'm standing in front of Babe Ruth's locker. Uh, I didn't know I would become obsessed with Babe to the point where I've written three books about him. Actually, four, because I turned the first one into a young adult book. How did this happen? As you can see, at a young age, I was born to he is the most written about American sports figure, uh, way ahead of number two, Jack Robinson. And the books keep on coming, evidenced by Jane Levy's book on uh, The Big Fella and The Full Shot by Thomas Wolfe, uh, Saber Member, which was released a few months ago. And a book called The Day, a Saber publication edited by Bill Nolan, Nolan and Glenn Sparks. I'm working on a novel about Babe's trip to Cuba in 1920 to John McGraw and the Giants. Uh, I came about this when I moved to North Carolina. Uh, I got involved in the baseball community and heard that Babe Ruth played in Wilmington, uh, where I live. And I researched that and found uh, that it was true that Babe Ruth came here in the 19, in 1914 and played against the uh, Philadelphia Athletics, who were the world champions at the time. Uh, as I started to uh, do this research, I learned that Babe Ruth's father died five days before the 1918 World Series. So I went to the Chicago Tribune to see what was written about uh, this young superstar who was the pitcher for the first game for the Red Sox. And all I found in the newspaper was the stories, stories about a bombing of a federal building in Chicago. Uh, and uh, below the fold, there were interviews of witnesses, and one of the eyewitnesses uh, stated that uh, I was a substitute letter carrier, and I was in the post office. I just got through sorting my mail or finishing my roof. I was walking out, going out a certain entrance when it was bombed. I was right in the lobby when, boom, this thing went off. Here comes the dust and shouting and everything uh, that was the way I went out every night. I missed that thing by three minutes. Well, that uh, letter carrier was this young man here. Um, that's Walt Disney. Uh, Walt Disney was at the site of the bombing and barely missed being uh, consumed in that uh, in the fire and explosion. So that convinced me that uh, this was a story that needed to be written. Uh, and I uh, felt that uh, it was time to, for somebody to deal with the issue of Dave and uh, you know, how he dealt with the pressure of being a 20 year old, 23 year old star. Uh, with his father died. And that led me to 
Dave's early life. Uh, Dave was uh, born in the uh, building, which is now the Dave's birthplace museum, pictured here on the left. And it was in an area known as Pig Town. Uh, you can see in the picture on the right that uh, pigs were driven through the streets from the uh, rail yards to the slaughterhouses. And as you might imagine, it was uh, not uh, exactly the greatest place to grow up in terms of uh, poverty and, and uh, just poor conditions. But one of the uh, one of the things I'd like to dispel is the rumor that Babe was an orphan. Uh, this is a picture of Babe with his mother. Uh, they lived in Pig Town. His father was a uh, his, his father was a bartender, and Babe uh, early on was a very wild, wild kid. Uh, I learned early to drink beer and wine and whiskey, and I think I was about five when I first chewed tobacco. Uh, Babe uh, was a wild kid, and he, he um, I'm trying to operate to be here, so bear with me. But Babe was part of an extended family. Uh, his mother gave birth to eight children, and she suffered greatly when five of them died as infants and toddlers. Uh, she found solace in liquor, and it didn't help that the father ran a bar. She became an alcoholic. When George hired the bartender to help, uh, he admonished the bartender not to let his wife have any drink. Uh, uh, unfortunately, in desperation, she traded sex for booze, and George Sr. caught them in Labrante Delicto. He threatened the man with a gun, and then he sued for divorce. Very few, if any, of the books uh, discuss the fact that Babe Ruth's parents got divorced. But one of the interesting things was the mother was uh, fined $10 for adultery, and uh, the father was given custody of three children Babe, uh, Mamie, his sister, who we are familiar with, both survived, and then a younger brother named William was an infant who died a year later. Uh, so they lost six siblings, uh, his mother to alcoholism, and he ended up uh, living with his father, and his father sent him to, to St. Mary's. St. Mary's Industrial School for uh, for orphans and corrigible of greater boys. And it was run by the Catholic Church, by the Bavarian brothers, and uh, foremost among the Bavarian brothers was Brother Matthias, who was a giant of a man, 6'6", uh, 350 pounds, and he taught Dave baseball and discipline. Uh, over the years, Dave acknowledged that uh, Brother Matthias was greatest man he ever knew. And uh, there were over 40 teams uh, at St. Mary's, 40 baseball teams, and they promptly uh, became one of the strongest players. He played every position, including catcher. He was a left-handed catcher. He, they only had a right-handed catcher, today, so he would catch the ball with one hand, with his uh, left hand, drop the glove, pick up the ball with his right hand, and then throw it back, and he often threw out base runners. Uh, Brother Matthias was known for hitting the ball with a bucko bat one-handed, and he would hit the ball over 300 feet, and they 
uh, was very impressed with that power and sought to emulate uh, Brother Matthias. So, they stayed at St. Mary's until he was 19 years old when he was signed by the uh, AAA Baltimore Oreo team run by Jack Dunn. And in 1914, he went to North Carolina for spring training. Uh, this is the sign that is in Fayetteville, North Carolina, where, where they held spring training. And Babe Ruth did his first home run in professional baseball uh, as uh, a 19 year old. He eclipsed the record of Jim Thorpe, who had previously hit home runs in Fayetteville that were the longest ever. Babe Ruth eclipsed his, uh, his home runs. And one of the things that uh, that I've done is I have an audio version of Dave was hitting that home run. It's available on our website, simplyfrancispublishing.com, and it's kind of a, a pretty neat story. Well, from Fayetteville, the Baltimore Orioles were invited to play in Wilmington. Uh, this is a very great picture of the athletics and the Orioles around uh, the entrance to Sunset Park, which was a spring training camp back in 1914. And Babe Ruth uh, started the game, pitched a three-game victory. There were six Hall of Famers on the field, including Babe, and Babe's team won nine to, nine to two. Now, there's an image of Dave as a, a, a fat, uh, overweight, not particularly athletic uh, ball player. Uh, and this cartoon uh, reinforces that image. However, Dave was uh, an amazing physical specimen. He was 6'2", 190 pounds uh, when he signed on the professional ball. And as he uh, as he progressed in his career, uh, he was known for his incredible appetites. And he did balloon up to about 250 pounds. And in his later career, he was a narrow-chested, uh, spindly leg ball player. But he was uh, quite an athlete as, as a young man. Now, um, Babe was his own worst enemy. Um, and to make matters worse, uh, Jacob Rupert uh, had a brewery uh, right around uh, the corner from Babe's father's saloon in Baltimore. And Babe had acquired a taste for, for beer. But he was pretty philosophical about it. He said, sometimes when I reflect on all the beer I drink, I feel ashamed. Then I look into the glass and think about the workers in the brewery and all of their hopes and dreams. If I didn't drink this beer, they might be out of work and their dreams would be shattered. So I think it's better to drink this beer and let their dreams come true than to be selfish and worry about my living. Uh, Dave was quite a character and uh, certainly uh, became more out there as he got older. Uh, here are some pictures of the young young babe, and you can see he was actually skinny. Uh, one of the uh, interesting quotes about babe, his daughter Julia was once asked, uh, what did babe talk about, uh, about his early years at St. Mary's? And babe said he never felt full. And when he did get an opportunity to go to spring training, uh, he was known for his amateur appetite. And he would you know, be reported to be a dozen eggs and half a dozen sausages and a couple of waffles in one sitting. And the, uh, the management 
or the poor quality of us were surprised at how much it consumed and how much it, uh, it cost. But they were pretty happy because he, uh, he was a fantastic pitcher, so much so that in the middle of the season in 1914, he was traded to the Boston Red Sox. So here was a young man who six months earlier had been in a reformatory uh, playing sandlot ball, and now he was at Fenway uh, pitching for the uh, tremendous team that they had in Boston at that time. Uh, during his tenure with Boston, uh, he was the best left-handed pitcher in the American League and arguably in the entire major leagues. Uh, during the offseason between 1914 and 1915, uh, they flew back to Baltimore. Uh, with it and got uh, married to Helen Woodford, who uh, was a waitress that he met at one of the, one of the uh, local luncheonettes. Uh, and they got married in Ellicott City and lived there uh, over the bar with Dave Swan. Uh, in 1915, they went to uh, uh, Hot Springs, Arkansas, and they began to show his prodigious power by hitting balls uh, over 500 feet into the neighboring alligator pond. Just to give you a quick idea of what a phenomenal pitcher David was, during his years with Boston, in the first year, uh, he only won two games because he was only there for part of the season. But from 1915, to 1919, uh, including the two games uh, that he won in 1914. Big won 89 games and lost only 46. And he had an ERA of 2.19. A couple of things that are, are interesting. In 1916, he led the league uh, with a 23 and 12 record, an ERA of 175, and he pitched. 332 innings and gave up only 230 hits. And he pitched nine complete game shutouts. Uh, and that was a, a major league record until it was uh, tied by Ron Gifford in 1978. They pitched 23 complete games in 1960. Uh, can you imagine, if you look at Garrett Cole, contract that he got, can you imagine what Babe Ruth the pitcher would have got throwing 323 innings and nine shutouts and winning 23 games. So Babe was uh, an amazing pitcher. Now, uh, a couple of miscellaneous things. Uh, here's a picture of Babe signing uh, a baseball and you'll notice that even though Dave was left-handed, uh, this he's signing the baseball right hand. And for anybody who went to Catholic school, uh, it is really uh, that's really the answer. Uh, I went to Catholic school, I guess, in a year or later than that, and they allowed me to, to write left-handed. But back in Dave's day, uh, they made sure that you batted uh, that you throw right hand. Uh, the other oddity is this is a picture of the statue outside of Camden Yards. And uh, it's a young babe looking forward to his uh, great future. The only problem with the statue is that the sculptor uh, made uh, put a right handed glove on his head. So uh, that flaw has not been corrected and it's kind of an anomaly uh, interesting to, to take a look at. Uh, so another uh, oddity about Babe Ruth is when he was playing uh, uh, in the major leagues, he had, when it was extremely hot, he would take cabbage leaves and soak them in ice and then 
before he went out on the field and put a cabbage leaf under his cap to keep him cool. Uh, you know, again, Babe was uh, kind of a unique character and a very interesting guy. Uh, one of the most interesting uh, things that I learned about is Babe's imperfect game. In 1917, uh, Babe started the game as the pitcher, starting pitcher, and the uh, first couple of pitches were they broke the strikes and the umpire pulled the balls, and they started uh, degrading the young fellow to put his glasses on, and uh, ultimately the umpire warned him if he didn't shut up and pitch that he would be thrown out of the game. Well, Babe threw another pitch and the umpire squeezed him for ball three. And Babe said, well, if you throw me out of the game, I'm going to knock your block away. And sure enough, the next pitch, Babe threw ball four. And uh, Babe charged the umpire and this clearly knocked the umpire to the ground and had to be carried off the field by the manager and, and the police. Well, the, the most fascinating thing about this game is that uh, Ernie Shore came in to pitch. And on the first pitch, the batter who went off tried to steal second, and he was gunned down. So that was the first out of the game. And Ernie Shore got the next 26 outs. And originally, it was called the perfect game. Uh, Later, when the rules were changed, they called it a no hitter. Uh, but so Dave was uh, the first pitcher, Dave and Ernie Shaw were the first pitchers to pitch a combined no hitter. So that brings us to 1918 and the wartime and the pandemic. Uh, as you know, 1918, uh, the United States was involved in. In World War One, uh, in May of that year, they got uh, the flu. Uh, it was also the year of the Spanish flu pandemic. They got the flu in, in May, and he went into the trainer, and the trainer poured silver nitrate down his throat, which burned his throat horribly, and they ended up in the hospital for ten days. The war was uh, fast uh, in, in full force and in show of patriotism. Uh, baseball players were uh, asked to march using their bats and uh, substitute for rifles. And the Secretary of Defense issued a worker fight law, which basically cut the season short. Uh, and the World Series was held uh, in September, uh, and Babe Ruth was involved, uh, you know, pitching in the World Series. This is a picture of uh, back in the day, 1918, with players and umpires wearing masks to protect themselves against the uh, against the pandemic. So Babe Ruth pitched. Uh, the first game of, of that World Series and pitched the shutout and won one to nothing. He also pitched game four. Uh, game four was uh, the first three games were in Chicago, and game four uh, was in Boston. So both the teams took the train together uh, back to Boston. And during that time, the players fraternized uh, and became very unhappy with the split and the money that they were going to receive. Uh, so that comes up in game five. But during a train ride, they got into uh, a little horse play with one of one of his teammates, and he injured. Uh, one of the fingers on his pitching finger. And that caused him to have a bad 
controlled in game four, and he pitched seven shutout innings, and then he, he walked six batters during the game, and in the eighth inning, he gave up two runs, and those two runs broke his scoreless streak, which was 29 in the third uh, innings, uh, which was the standard in the World Series until 1961, when, as you recall, uh, Roger Harris broke Babe Ruth's home run record, and Whitey Ford broke Babe Ruth's uh, scoreless pitching record. Uh, Babe frequently said that that pitching record, that he was most proud of that pitching record, even more so than the city. So they, uh, in 1919, they, let me go back a second. Uh, in 1918, uh, they tied uh, the league, league with 11 home runs, and he wanted to play more. And in 1919, he did play the field more and ended up breaking uh, the then existing home run record with 29 home runs. Uh, he asked for a sizable praise, and Harry Crazy, who was the owner, uh, called Babe the Bicester and uh, decided to sell him to the Yankees. Uh, he was sold around Christmas, I think it was Christmas Eve, the transaction was completed, and he became a, a New York Yankee. Well, Babe uh, was not too thrilled about that, and he wanted to make sure he got some money. So here's a, uh, a boxing card, uh, evidence of Babe threatening to take up a career as a boxer unless he was going to get the money that he asked for. And here's Babe signing with Jacob Cooper, who gave him a three-year contract and doubled his salary. So Babe was... Uh, was happy and went to spring training with the Yankees in 1920. And one of his teammates uh, was King Bodie. His real name was Francesco Pizzolo, and he was Babe's first uh, roommate. And the reporters wanted to know about this young phenom, and they asked uh, King Bodie, what was it like to move with Babe Ruth? Well, King Bodie said, you know, Dave's never in the room. I'm living with his suitcase. And the reason Dave wasn't in the room was because Dave was a renowned womanizer. But there's an interesting story uh, uh, that took place that spring regarding King Cody. Uh, there was a, an animal farm not too far from uh, the spring training camp in St. Petersburg. And the promoter of the animal farm decided to have a contract, a, an eating contest, a pasta eating contest uh, between King Bodie and Percy. Percy was the resident ostrich, and uh, they set about having this pasta eating contest. King Bodie uh, outlasted Percy by eating 11 plates of pasta. When Percy got to the 11th plate, he keeled over and fainted, had to get his stomach pumped out. Dave was also uh, a great golfer, and uh, during spring training, he once invited Robert Swansky, the great St. Louis Cardinal, to play golf. And Swansky declined and said, I don't want to play golf. When I hit a ball, I want someone else to chase it. And that was sort of Babe's attitude as well. Uh, so Babe was married, as I mentioned earlier, Babe was married early uh, in his baseball career. Here's a picture of Babe with Helen uh, in 1922. Uh, Helen showed up at spring training with a 15-year-old father. Uh, and uh, there was a lot of Disinformation about how uh, that baby came to uh, the babe and, and Helen. Uh, there were rumors about uh, 
Hayden, the mother, uh, but they steadfastly argued or, or took the position that Dorothy was uh, Helen's daughter. Uh, nobody knew that Helen had been pregnant, nobody knew that she had given birth, so it raised a lot of suspicion. And, and Babe Ruth's uh, relationship with uh, with his first wife was uh, pretty pretty ragged. Uh, early on, she uh, did not like the bright lights of New York. Uh, Dave was uh, like a, uh, a young animal set free, and there was not any appetite that he did not uh, try to uh, satisfy. Uh, he, was making money, he was a big star, and uh, she didn't want to be around that. So she went back to Boston. Uh, years later, tragedy struck, and in 1929, Dave's um, wife, his first wife, was killed in a uh, killed in a house fire. She was uh, apparently living with a dentist called Dr. Kinder. She was known as Mrs. Kinder, even though they had never been divorced. Uh, Dave was a Catholic and, and the church did not recognize divorce. So there was uh, quite a scandal when it was discovered that Mrs. Kinder was in fact Ellen, Ellen Ruth, um, and there was some concern about the uh, about the origins of the fire. Helen's family were quite upset about Dave in general and about the fire. And her Helen's sister uh, claimed that uh, she had attended a meeting in New York with Dave and the divorce lawyer. And Dave had, and she had asked Dave for $100,000, and allegedly Dave stormed out of the meeting. And the sister therefore demanded that the DA open an investigation into uh, the death of Helen, uh, implying that uh, Dave might have had her killed. Uh, there was also suspicion that uh, the dentist. Uh, was providing her with opium, and uh, he might have had some reason to cause her death. So there was an investigation, and ultimately, uh, it was determined that there was no foul play, that she had died from uh, suffocation uh, as a result of the fire. Uh, years later, uh, Dave's daughter Dorothy wrote a book. And in the book, she, uh, she claimed that a family friend named Juanita Jennings was actually Dave's mistress and her mother. And she had given birth to Dorothy, and Dave and Helen uh, took the baby in and raised her as their own. Uh, so there's a lot of intrigue and interest about, uh, about the birth of Dorothy, and as we'll see later uh, in the next uh, area I'll discuss, uh, Dorothy becomes central to the relationship between Dave and Lou Gehrig. Um, Dave and Lou Gehrig were teammates, and uh, in 1929, uh, they began the practice of putting numbers on jerseys. And Dave batted third, so he was number three, and Gary batted fourth, so he was number four. Uh, they spent a lot of time. Dave, uh, you know, was a seasoned veteran by the time he came along. He was 23 and 24, and uh, they took him under the swing. Uh, they did a lot of barnstorming, and here they are in the pictures. The Brooklyn Blues and the Buster Names, and they would travel all over the country during the off season and uh, make a, a 
lot of money, they make more money in the off season than they did throughout their careers. Um, now there was uh, a rift between Bay and, uh, and Lou, and it was based on, according to some sources, based on an incident where uh, Claire, who was Bay's second wife, uh, and her and her daughter uh, were invited to Mrs. Garrett's for a meal, and they brought along uh, Bay's daughter Dorothy, who had been adopted by Claire, and Mrs. Garrett made comment about how shabby Dorothy's clothes were and compared to in comparison to Julia's clothes. Um, uh, Claire went and told Dave uh, that she had been insulted by Mrs. Garrett, the Lou's uh, mother, and Dave went to Lou and complained. And Lou, who was uh, known as a modest boy and had a very close relationship with his mother, uh, took offense. And they didn't talk for many years. As a matter of fact, uh, it was not until 1935 when uh, they reconciled. And this is a picture taken at Yankee Stadium uh, when uh, Lou Gehrig made his on the Buckless Man on Earth speech, and he was dying from ALS. So uh, you can see they kind of wanted to be the dominant big brother, and who was kind of had the smile on his face, like, yeah, okay, I'll tolerate you. Uh, it's very interesting dynamic uh, between those uh, two, two superstars. So they were they were both members of the 1927 Yankees, who were called uh, the first six men in the order were called Murderers Row because they had uh, so much power and, and such an offensive juggernaut uh, that they would just devastate other teams. Uh, in those days, of course, there were no night games, so games would start at 3 o'clock. And uh, this team was known uh, for what they called 5 o'clock lightning. Usually, the end of the game was uh, happening around 5 o'clock, uh, and that's when the bats would wake up and they would put, put the team into victory. One of the things I'd like to commend is an ESPN series called The Diary of Miles Thomas, which is, uh, you can find it on the internet. And it's uh, Miles Thomas was one of the secondary pitchers on that team. And this is a fictional diary by him, day by day, of uh, that. 1927 championship season, and he goes into all sorts of uh, off, uh, off the field shenanigans that were going on uh, with the players and gives uh, a really interesting insight into how the locker room uh, relationships were and, and how Dave was perceived. Uh, one of the things that uh, he reported in his diary was that when, when the Yankee wives put their children to bed, they asked them to pray for Babe Ruth. And the reason they did that is because Babe was the real team. Uh, Babe was the one that uh, provided uh, them with so much of their income. Uh, Babe was a practical joker. Uh, he was known, among other things, for the pull by finger joke, uh, where they would hold out his finger and uh, get some unsuspecting uh, ball player to pull his finger, upon uh, which they would unleash uh, some nasty flatulence. And he thought that was one of the funniest things. One of the other interesting practical jokes that Dave uh, was known for, uh, he and 
find it one of the pictures, a picture in the Wells in 1929 with the Star of the Yankees. You find it in the go on a double date. Uh, and they arrived at this house, and the house was dark, and uh, uh, they knocked on the door, and rather, and, and Ed Wells was right next to them. And rather than uh, have a shift of young woman answer the door, and our great husband answered the door, and he pulled out a snub nose pistol and fired two shots at Dave. Dave fell down and uh, yelled to Ed, I'm hit, run, Ed, run. And Wells didn't have to uh, uh, be invited more than once to run, and he took off, he hightailed it and eventually made, made his way back to the hotel. When he got into the lobby, Earl Combs uh, went over to him and said, Dave's been shot, he's up in his room. I don't think he's gonna make it. And uh, Wells went up to the room and Dave was lying on the bed. Uh, they had put talcum powder on his face, ketchup on his chest, and he looked like uh, he was on his last legs. Well, over uh, to take a closer look. The babe sat up and well swinging. Uh, uh, they all got a good laugh. The other players were in the room and uh, they thought that was uh, quite hilarious. Uh, one of the other players on that team was Will Seymour. Uh, Will Seymour was uh, top of the league for more than uh, 40 banks. Uh, in those championship years, and he was a notoriously bad hitter. Uh, Dave Ruth bet him two hundred dollars that he couldn't get three hits during the course of the season. On the last day of the season, four uh, leg down and into a single, and they had to pay up. So they paid more. And here's a picture of four with two mules that that he bought. Dave's 200 bucks. And uh, rightfully so, he named one Dave and the other one Ruth. So they like to have fun. And uh, here's a picture of Dave with President Herbert Hoover. Uh, Hoover was the president uh, when the uh, stock market crashed. Uh, in 1930, they threatened to hold out for $80,000. And the press said, $80,000 a year in these times? Don't be silly, Dave. Why, that's more than the president gets. And Babe Ruth says, What the hell does we have got to do with this? Anyway, I had a better year than he did. And, uh, you know, it just shows Dave's uh, attitude that he knew he was a valuable entertainment. Uh, he didn't want to get paid for it. He was uh, once compared to John Barrymore, the famous actor, and they said, I don't care a damn about any actors. What good will John Barrymore do with a basic load of two down in a tight folder? Either I get more money than Barrymore or I don't play. So Dave uh, was quite a character, and he certainly. Uh, certainly uh, was interesting topic. Uh, one of the interesting uh, aspects of Dave's career was the so-called call shot in 1932. And I'm going to play uh, a brief video of uh, that event. Very number one, there's no question. He was one of the very greatest leaders ever. 1932 series is page last. It produces his greatest movement. Oh, must have a shot off Charlie Boot. Yeah. Oh, what a moment. Yeah, 
intelligence for U.S. inaccuracy of understanding was approximately 10 percent of the one. So he was uh, quite a, a, a physical specimen, uh, and his performance dictated that. One of the things that always amazes me was how much better than his Peter's paper was. Uh, several times he had his individual home run totals exceeded those of uh, the entire other teams. Uh, so uh, he was quite quite the uh, quite the superstar and rightfully deserves uh, his status. Uh, now one of the things that Dave was known for early in his career was his profitability. He uh, spent money like it was water and lived like there was no tomorrow. Uh, when he got to New York, uh, he barely was solid. And, and then one day he was in his hotel and there was a knock on the door and there was room service carrying face of Peter. So he opened the door and the uh, room service person was Kristen Walsh, who appears uh, in this picture with Dave. Kristen Walsh was a uh, struggling newspaper cartoonist and a newspaper writer, and he wanted to be Dave Ruth's agent. Uh, Dave Ruth uh, didn't have an agent at that time. Uh, he was the first major sports figure to have an agent. Uh, it was just not the type of uh, endeavor that uh, baseball players or athletes got involved in. Uh, he uh, was the first ball player, thanks to Kristen Walsh, to monetize his fame. Uh, they, uh, as I mentioned earlier, made a lot of money Barnstorming. Here's a picture of Dave riding a car with horns on it uh, and cowboy dog. Um, he was quite the showman, and then people would come out and throw us all over the country uh, to see Dave Ruth. Um, he oftentimes barnstormed with players from uh, the Negro Leagues and uh, a lot of money. He looked up on the international movie database. He had 10 film credits, including uh, playing himself in the part of the Yankees, the story about the gallery of the story of the The question I frequently ask is well, what about the name of the coach? I'm sorry. Uh, this fellow uh, is Ford Frick. He was a sports writer who Walsh hired to be the ghostwriter for Dave Ruth. And many of you may recognize his name because he later became the commissioner of baseball. And in 1961, when Dave, uh, Dave's single season home run record was being challenged by Bobby Harris, Ford Frick decreed that any Time that if Maris broke the record, there would be an asterisk next to it because they played 162 games compared to 154 games played when Dave set the record at 60. Uh, there was no real um, outcry that Ford Trek really had a conflict of interest. And one of the things uh, I I know this was in, in uh, this last version of the Sabre Journal. There was an article about that 61 season and they compared the uh, bats, the number of the bats. And Maris had fewer at bats per game. So at the end of the day, Babe Ruth only had seven fewer plate appearances than Maris. So, you know, Fort Trek was. Uh, trying to protect his uh, former client um, and uh, made a controversy over the last six breaking days. 
that probably should be involved. So I'm often asked about the baby growth candy bar. Uh, the baby growth candy bar uh, was uh, established in the uh, early 1900s, uh, but it was not trademarked until 1919. You recall in 1919, they broke the all-time home run record. Babe Ruth was a World Series star. Babe Ruth was a, probably the most famous person in the country. And the Curtis Candy Company uh, tried to take advantage of that and did take advantage of that by trademarking the name Baby Ruth. When it was challenged, there was uh, a claim made that Baby Ruth was named after the daughter of former President Robert Cleveland, who died in 1905 uh, at the age of five years old. Uh, I doubt that anybody in the public uh, really remembered when they were uh, David Ruth uh, Cleveland, uh, when Dave Ruth was just a really superstar. So they uh, started. His own, uh, his own candy bar, the Roots Home Run Bar, and he was sued by the Curtis Candy Company, and they prevailed. The court ruled that uh, their trademark was valid, and that Dave's candy bar was uh, infringed by their trademark. So, throughout the uh, billions of baby group candy bars that have been consumed, Dave Ruth and his estate uh, got zero, no money for uh, any of the uh, royalties from that candy bar. So one of Dave's uh, biggest attributes was his power. Uh, Dave uh, had supernatural power compared to uh, the average player in, in an era where home run Baker led the league with 12 home runs. Babe would surpass that uh, often and every week broke the 20 home run barrier, the 30 home run, 40 home run, 50, and 60 home run barrier. Uh, Babe was once asked if he had any superstitions. He said, just one. Whenever I hit a home run, I want to make sure I touch all four bases. He hit quite a number of lengthy home runs and six fitties claimed to be the site of Dave's longest home run. Uh, in Detroit, 1921, uh, they claimed that he hit a ball in a field that traveled 575 feet. Austin, New York, uh, Dave and the Yankees went to play uh, against the Simpson correctional team. And they hit a, a ball that uh, went over the prison wall and landed 620 feet from home plate. Uh, St. Petersburg, Florida. Uh, they uh, was getting ready for his last uh, season, and he hit a ball off the West Coast end that traveled 610 feet. Uh, Tampa, Florida claims that they hit a ball. 587 feet in 1919, and they have an historical market entitled Dave's Longest Home Run. Who does there? Well, I'll keep going. But the, the longest home run. Uh, <laughs> Most amazing position comes from Atlanta, where Babe Ruth hit a home run at Ponce de Leon Park. Uh, that was the home of the Atlanta Crackers. Uh, and uh, according to Colonel Bruce Hampton, right beneath the radio tower, there was a bank where Babe Ruth hit a home run in 1928. All carried over the bank and went to the railroad tracks into a railroad. And the ball traveled to Joplin, Missouri, 752 miles, the longest home run ever taken. Uh, I harken back to uh, 
back to the uh, quote from schoolboy Corey, all lies about David are true. Uh, it, it just shows uh, uh, David's ability to capture the imagination. Another uh, interesting adventure uh, that David had was in 1931. Yankees were playing an exhibition game and chatting with the lookouts. The lookouts had uh, signed a 17 year old left handed young woman catcher, and she came into the game and the pitch against uh, the Yankees. Uh, the first bat that she faced was Babe Ruth. This is a picture of Babe and Luke Garrett watching her warm up, and I just love. This uh, this guy was uh, in the background. His photo on the picture. Uh, I don't know who or what he is. Maybe he's a mailman or a police officer. Uh, but he's kind of an interesting looking guy. Uh, anyway, Babe uh, Ruth uh, and Gary were allegedly struck out by this young woman. One reporter said she had a swell team. Face and swing to mean lips. Uh, the two men on, she came in and pitched the day, and he was called out on a pitch on the outside corner to strike three. They threw the bat, waved his arms theatrically at the young, and walked off. Lou Gehrig uh, stepped up to the plate and swung and missed, and missed at least three pitches. At that point, Mitchell was taken out of the game. Uh, Mitchell, for her part, held her belief that she genuinely ripped the two Yankees. Uh, she said the only instruction the Yankees received was to try to avoid hitting the ball back up the box for fear of hurting her. Why, hell, they were trying to get right, she said, not long before death in 1987. Jim Thorne, the official historian of Major League Baseball, vigorously dis disagrees. He believes that Ruth and Garrett were in cahoots with the lookouts president and went along with the stuff. The whole thing was a jake, a jest, a Barnabas prank. He says, Jackie Mitchell striking out Dave and Garrett is a good story for children's books, but it belongs in the pantheon of the least environmental man of the public day. But they did have a uh, amazing uh, tie to American culture. Uh, this is a picture of Babe Ruth and Silent Bob Ruzo uh, at a exhibition game in 1922 uh, in Sleepy Eye, Minnesota. There was an article uh, a few years ago about a couple of Babe Ruth fans who uh, wanted to identify everyone in this picture. They were able to identify everybody but the young man uh, standing behind Russo, uh whose face is circled. Uh, they published an article about this and they received a phone call from the grandson of this fellow who said it was his 104 year old grandfather, Glenn Youngman. So these three fanatics got in their car, drove to Sleepy Guy, Minnesota, where they were greeted by the grandson and the 104 year old Glenn Youngman. Glenn Youngman uh, proceeded to tell the story of David's home run and how he was. In the bleachers in the outfield, and when they hit a home run, he was able to chase down the ball. And then uh, Mr. Youngman went to a cabinet, opened the door, and pulled out the baseball that they could hit uh, for a home run way back in the day. And it's just an example of the way David has captured, um, captured our uh, imagination. Dave was also uh, Dave was also known for his relationship with kids. Uh, 
here's a picture of Dave surrounded by several hundred fans. And you can see Dave is in the unhappy, he's reveling in the attention and the joy being with the kids. He was described by his teammates as a big kid himself. During his career, one of the fables about Babe Ruth has to do with the 1926 World Series when Babe Ruth visited Johnny Sylvester in a St. Louis hospital and promised that he would hit a home run. Babe, uh, during that series, uh, hit four home runs, including a 510 foot blast. Uh, it was also uh, he went and visited Sylvester in the, uh, in the hospital uh, two weeks after the World Series was concluded. So this shows us uh, how transcendent Dave was. And now I'd like to talk about Dave and Grace. Uh, the player on the left is uh, Buck O'Neill. Buck O'Neill is a Hall of Famer, uh, uh, just an amazing player, but also a wonderful personality. Uh, I got to hear Buck O'Neill speak in 1995 at the conference in Oxford University, a symposium on Dave Ruth celebrating his 100th birthday. So that would have been something. And Buck O'Neill said, the most amazing thing about Dave was the sound of the ball hitting the bat. He said it was distinctive, you could hear it from far away, and it was a thunderous crack uh, that sounded like no one had seen it before. Uh, Buck O'Neill also recalled Barnstorm with Dave and playing uh, against Dave Root uh, with Satchel Page on the mound. Uh, Dave just did a dominant home run, and as the ground, when he grounded the bases and got the home plate, Satchel Page was waiting for him to shake his hand, and they both stood at home plate and waited until uh, the fan, a fan had retrieved the ball, and they brought the ball out and they both signed the ball. Uh, Dave uh, was very comfortable and enjoyed playing. Uh, against and with the Negro League players. According to uh, Jim Johnson, uh, he was quite a guy, always a lot of fun. All the guys really liked him. On the other hand, he said, you could never seem to get him out, no matter what we do. Uh, in the games that were documented, and you have to remember that exhibition games uh, uh, were not always documented the way regular season. So, uh, in the games that were documented, Dave, uh, in, 40, in 55 at bats, hit 455 with 12 home runs. The black players loved him. Uh, indeed, uh, in 1927, during a barnstorming trip, uh, Dave and Lou Gehrig were invited uh, to visit the Wheatley Provident Hospital, which was the town's only black hospital. And Dave skipped lunch that day to, uh, to visit the sick black children. Uh, now there's a urban legend that Dave himself was black. Uh, I'm here to dispel that uh, urban legend. Uh, all you have to do is look at this picture, uh, admittedly covered uh, of Dave uh, and his father celebrating New Year's at his father's bar in, I think it was the winter of 1914. And you can see that they could be twins, uh, but for the separation of years. Uh, in addition, on the right, there is a picture of Dave uh, in shorts, uh, wearing only shorts. Uh, is not, not uh, African American. Uh, the families were uh, his, his in laws and his, uh, and his uh, 
father's side were uh, well known in the community. They were uh, uh, both of German American descent, and they uh, was particularly uh, not black. So how does Babe Ruth compare uh, with Hank Aaron? Hank Aaron is the all-time home run king. Uh, it's interesting when you look at their statistics. Babe Ruth had about 4,000 less at bats than Hank Aaron. Uh, he had 714 home runs versus 755 for Aaron. Uh, he had 2,213 RBI, and Aaron had 2,297, so pretty much the same. Uh, Dave had a, a career batting average of 342, uh, Hank hit 305. Uh, Dave had over 2,000 walks, and Aaron had only 1,400 walks. Uh, slugging percentage, Dave had a 690 slugging percentage. While Hank Aaron had a 550 by slugging percent. So statistically, uh, Babe is significantly uh, above Hank Aaron in many metrics. In the most recent issue of Saber, Saber Journal, there's a discussion of the all time greatest hitters. And Babe Ruth was listed as number one. And then the uh, statisticians uh, did some uh, uh, adjusting and weighting and uh, manipulation of statistics. And they said that uh, you know, Gary Bonds, uh, under that, under those limited metrics that were weighted, uh, was number one and Babe Ruth was number two. But again, when you look at the, what I consider the pertinent statistics, they had 1,500 less at bats. His batting average was 34 points above. His slugging percentage was almost 100 points higher. And that doesn't even take into account that they won 94 big league games with a 2.28 career ERA. Uh, also, it doesn't take into account change in the home run rates. Uh, back when they played, if you hit a walk or a home run, uh, you only got a single uh, when the winning run scored. Uh, if the ball bounced back into the field, it was considered a double. And if the ball went fair toward the foul pole and then landed past the foul pole outside the uh, Field uh, that was considered a foul ball, and they lost numerous uh, home runs uh, based on those rules. Uh, they was also a victim in 1934. Uh, Deep went barnstorming. Uh, it's an interesting poster on the left of Bay uh, with his features, uh, somewhat altered to a bit more of an Asian look. Also, the picture on the right is made with uh, young youngsters, young Japanese youngsters who are obviously having a uh, time of life. Uh, they've uh, left a big impression on Japan uh, and is credited with having, uh, having inspired the, uh, the, the beginning of professional baseball in Japan. When the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, Dave uh, was felt betrayed, and uh, he was removed with some of his souvenirs out of all the people in his work site by the apartment in New York, and he uh, was very unhappy with New York. Uh, one of the players on that team was Paul Bird, probably familiar with uh, the catcher was a spy. He was a brilliant guy. He was a backup catcher, good backup, and uh, he spoke seven languages. And according to one of his teammates, 
Pictures of Tokyo Harbor uh, during that monsoon uh, tour, and those pictures were used by Hulu's Raiders when they bombed Tokyo. Uh, they wanted to be a manager at the end of his career. He signed uh, with the Boston Braves, and uh, he he uh, wanted to manage the Yankees. Cooper allegedly said, you can't manage yourself. How can you expect to manage the man? But that wasn't true because after his first season as a Yankee, Cooper offered uh, Babe the job as a player manager. Babe declined. And after Babe's marriage to Claire, uh, he became a very responsible adult and uh, can't down his, his wild days. Uh, Babe, uh, was promised to be the manager of, uh, of the Braves, but after uh, a few games into the season, he realized that he was just being used in that those promises and lies. Uh, there's an urban legend that Dave only gave his last, uh, last game. It's not exactly true. Uh, he hit three home runs in, uh, in May. That's uh, considered his best game, but he actually played five games before he packed it in. Uh, next up were the Dodgers, who hired Dave as a coach in 1938. The Yankees reported that he was being hired to be the next uh, manager in 1939. But unfortunately for Dave, Neil DeRocher, who in this picture is uh, Standing with Dave. Um, the Roshan was the captain of the Dodgers. He undermined Dave Cook. And why did he do that? Well, first, he wanted to be the manager. But second, when he was with the Yankees, he allegedly stole Dave Cook's watch. And Dave Cook had him traded and basically put down the American League because of that design. Roshan was able to uh, get paid back when he uh, prevented Dave Bruce from being the manager of the Dodgers. Uh, along the lines of Dave being a transcendent figure, uh, this is a, an ad taken out in 1942 in the New York Times, and Dave Bruce was the most prominent person who signed this. Uh, it says in part, we Americans of German descent raise our voices in denunciation of the Hitler policy of cold blooded extermination of Jews of Europe and against barbarities committed by the Nazis against all innocent peoples under their sway. We utterly repudiate every thought and deed of Hitler and the Nazis and urge the people of Germany to overthrow the Nazi regime. Now, that was a pretty courageous thing to do in 1942. Uh, it wasn't uh, necessarily a slam dunk that the United States would defeat Germany. But um, you know, Dave was a courageous character. Uh, here's a picture, a uh, famous picture of Dave uh, at, at Yankee Stadium in June of 1948. This iconic picture won a Pulitzer Prize. Now, if you look at this fellow uh, kneeling on the first baseline, his name is Ralph Morse. He took a picture of Dave uh, from that angle, and in that picture, it was a color picture. In those days, it took three days to develop the color picture. By the time Morse's picture was developed, uh, the black and white had gone viral, even though they didn't have to be viral in those days. So, uh, interesting backstory to those pictures. Uh, Dave died in August of 1948. Uh, there was a massive outpouring of uh, grief and support for Dave. 
tens of thousands show up at uh, the state and where it's in the polls. When they got to heaven, uh, St. Peter asked them if they wanted to manage the celestial false gods. And Dave said uh, that he certainly would. Uh, and then St. Paul challenged them. And St. Peter chuckled and said, you know, we have, uh, I know you have Python, but we have Ruth Wagner, Matheson, Cy Young, Eric, Herbert, and Williams. Uh, it won't even be a contest. And Satan says, of course it will be. And Satan says, well, how, how, could that be? how could it be a contest? And Satan says, well, we have the umpires. So um, the, the question that transcends uh, everything is how would they bear in the 21st century? It's one of those imponderables. I mean, if I've been asked how many home runs do you think they could hit today, and I say about 11 or 12, and people kind of raise their eyebrows. I say, wow, hey, these people be 125 years old. What do you expect? Uh, so I think it's a fair question. Uh, I would maintain that uh, they would still be transcendent ball player. You look at the difference in travel. Um, the teams in those days before Marvin Miller uh, got involved with the CBA, they played games uh, in between exhibition games. Uh, they play exhibition games on the off days. Uh, the safety equipment, uh, they wore no helmets. Uh, today they wear all sorts of body armor. The picture on the left is Dave running into a wall where it might feel that he knocked unconscious. The trainer came out and splashed cold water on his face. Uh, today, he would be on the concussion protocol, uh, get an MRI, a CAT scan. Uh, so, uh, the difference in, in equipment and treatment uh, goes both ways. Uh, one thing I was told was that in Dave's day, these were hot dogs. And so he might have been accused of eating too many hot dogs. But it's an interesting uh, question. At the end of the day, nobody could really say, uh, you know, what that hypothetical would prove. Uh, I just like to go uh, back to. Uh, quote from the movie Sandlot, where the catcher Benny says to uh, Smalls, Babe Ruth is the greatest ball player that ever lived. People say he was less than a god or more than a man, you know, like Hercules or something. That ball you just based to the beast that's worth, well, more than your whole life. And I'll leave you with the final quote uh, from Dave. Heroes get remembered but legends never die. And Babe Ruth was certainly a legend. And uh, it's glad, I'm glad to see you alive and well today. Uh, that uh, concludes my presentation. I thank you for your attention. And if uh, Pete, I know I couldn't hear you before, uh, but we would hope to do a raffle. If you could give three names and uh, get their addresses, I'd be happy to send them a t-shirt uh, from my first book. Uh, it was really great being here, and uh, you know, despite the technical difficulties, uh, I had a good time. I hope you learned something, and I hope you enjoyed the presentation. And I'd be happy to entertain any questions if there are. To email or uh, send Frank um, a chat question now. We have about 15 minutes left before we have to get off.
Hi, Frank. I have a question on that uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina historical marker that says Babe Ruth's first homer, 435 yards northwest. Is that northwest of the marker or the ballpark is that far away? Hello. Hey Tom, I don't think he can hear you. Okay, I unmuted my uh, screen. Okay. Hold Can you hear me? I can barely hear you, the whole program. I, I can't make it any louder. Um, the historical marker in North Carolina. Okay. Where, uh, where I, I see some of the chats that people could barely hear. Uh, was that a problem across the board? Yeah, I can barely hear you. Hello? I mean, the question is, Babe Ruth's first home run marker in North Carolina, it says 435 yards northwest. Northwest of what? From that, that exact sign? Tom, uh, I'm Francis Kinlaw and I live here in North Carolina. And I think uh, these markers are, that would be that distance from the sign. From the sign? Yes, because I don't believe they, they can always put a sign up exactly where it occurred or um, where the, you know, it would be off a road where people can't get to it. Yeah, or in the middle of a lake or something, right? <laughs> or, yeah, a, cor a field or something like that. Or there might have been a building built there. So if it's a 435 yards times three, that's what? 500 and some feet? From that play. But, the, you know, in other words, <clears throat> that's where it probably hit the ball. That distance from the sign. Okay. But the because sign was not at home plate. Yes. No. Uh, because often... You know, I know uh, the uh, Historical Commission in North Carolina puts them on a road so that people will see the sign because the event might be away from the road. Right. Yeah, I understand. Maryland, I was driving through uh, the Eastern Shore a couple of years ago looking for, there's a historical marker for one of the black ladies was, 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 uh, was uh, the leader of the civil rights movement and, and had the underground uh, railroad back in the um, you know, 1800s. Yeah. And there was a sign on the road that said, wherever she was born or wherever, this is dirt road. So I went down the dirt road and I couldn't find anything or see anything. So yes, well, sometimes you're all approximates. Yeah, well, of course, sometimes there is nothing there anymore, right. uh, you know, when you go to a place like that. Right. Also, on, the, on this chat, I tried to send the chat, but on my screen, I have no button that says send. How do you send a chat when you're writing as chat? Uh, I, 
I believe other people would know more about it than I do, certainly. But okay. what I usually do is I hit enter. And I think that usually sends them. After I do that? the chat. But other people probably know more about it than I do. Okay, because I don't have an enter on my uh, laptop uh, desktop. It's the Oh, wait, there's, there's on the right. Okay, hold on. Well, I pressed enter and see what happened. Also, I don't know what I won because I got on about five minutes late. You know what the prize is, was? A t-shirt, okay. I found the enter button. I, I've been doing it for years and not looking at what it said. All right, guys, any more questions? Since Frank is having audio problems, uh, if you do have them, might as well type them and he could answer or you can email him um about the books anything like that um about his upcoming book i think he mentioned um i don't know how good this is going to sound it has recorded so it should be on saber's uh virtual page and facebook page in the very near future um i'll let um jacob Uh, what does the T-shirt say on it? Is there any writing on it? Thanks, Frank. Have I been quiet all this time? Yes. Um, anybody else need to speak? Questions? Our smoothest talk, but it still went pretty well. So, um, guys, if you want to email Frank, uh, simplyfrancispublishing at gmail.com or Carolina Men's Baseball at gmail.com. Okay. Um, and like I said, it, uh, next Zoom call will be September 8th, I believe, the first Wednesday of the month at um, 7 p.m. I believe, uh, uh, Peter, looking at my calendar, I believe the Wednesday is the 9th. Okay, so it'll be September 2nd. Jeff corrected me. Oh, okay. So it'll be the Wednesday before Labor Day. Um, okay. and email on that, obviously, about a week out with uh, info on the on the speaker and subject matter. And will that probably be in the middle of the day again? No, that the first Wednesday one will be 7 to 9 p.m., just like it would if we were meeting in person at the brewery. Okay. Okay. So, 
Um, so I apologize for any technical difficulties. I'm not the greatest at this either. Um, but uh, hopefully we learned something. Um, got away from the, the rut of being at home. And it uh, looks like it's going to rain here. I got to check on the Orioles score. Nobody knows that they started at 1 o'clock. Um, do you think they can keep it going? <laughs> uh, well, they're down one nothing. They sweep the Phillies, they sweep Washington, and then they're going to get swept by Toronto. So who knows? It's very streaky. Right. Anything's impossible this short season. So, um, but uh, I guess if we're all okay, um, we'll, I'm going to sign off momentarily and uh, hope to see you guys again. You know how to reach me if you need anything. You guys have my uh, email address. You can reach through Facebook and uh, I'm, uh, I'm around the rest of the summer. So thank you all for coming and uh, be on the lookout for the next uh, email within a, probably about a week or so. Thank you, Frank. Thank and, uh, you. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Take care, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Stay Thanks. safe, Peter. Yeah.